Okay, thank you so much, um, Tristan and Fuyubi. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I'd like to start today and offer gratitude to the Musqueam people um, whose land I'm it's such an honor uh, to be a guest on today. And I also want to bring greetings from the village of Hello, um, the Chumash people on whose land I live and work in Santa Barbara. So it's a great honor to be here with all of you. Um, so I want to start out um, and speak about um, how my understanding of the Ainu experience in Hokkaido and in Japan has been shaped through the insight of two Ainu women in particular, many actually, but two in particular. The first is my Ainu bachan, uh, Toyama Saki bachan. Uh, Saki bachan was like my own grandmother. She taught me to listen with my entire body. Through living with her, um, I began to understand her profound respect, love, and her own humility before the incredible dignity and strength of her own ancestors. And all of my work with indigenous peoples today flows from the lessons of deep respect um, that she taught to me. So I want to honor her and also mention that I'm very saddened because we lost her in December of this year. So um, today my presentation is dedicated to her uh, and her entire family. Should I be wearing a mic? <laughs> okay. Um, secondly, um, I, I'm humbled and honored uh, to be in the presence of um, Ainu women and indigenous women scholars and honored guests. Um, we're gathered here on the occasion of Hokkaido's 150th anniversary, and yet I feel it is my duty as a student of Ainu women to begin by questioning this marker of Japan's modernity. Indeed, uh, Japan's foray into modernity is entwined with, even defined through, the project of invasive settler colonialism in Ainu Moshiri, which is uh, the Ainu traditional name for their ancestral land um, and the land that they still inhabit today. However, the question I would like to pose is this. What would it mean to take seriously the voices and perspectives of Ainu women in the 18th century and earlier? How would it force us to rethink the temporal frame and scale of Japan's colonial project? If we listen to the range of texts, and I'm not speaking simply of written texts, the range of texts fashioned by Ainu women, the state-centric and even politically ordered timeline of Hokkaido's colonization must be reconfigured. That is, the gendered colonization and state-sanctioned violence against Ainu women and by extension their entire families was instituted through the local wives policy in 1799. Specifically, the Tokugawa government allowed the Matsumai domain to operate contract fisheries in ports around Hokkaido which allowed them total control of the lucrative herring fishery from the 1740s through 1855. The Tokugawa state also imposed heteropatriarchy on Ainu women through the local wives institution, um, wherein they forced women to partner with Japanese men and to adopt the vertical patriarchal system of Japan. If we approach colonialism from Ainu women's lived experience of settler violence then, Japan's settler invasion of Ainu Moshiri must be revised to at least 1799, and I urge us to remember Ainu, Ainu um, own stories and own history and knowledge of that land as extending back to time immemorial to the land of their ancestors um, from the beginning of time in their history. So in this sense, uh, the gendering or excuse me, in this sense, the gendering, the history of settler colonialism in Japan forces us to rethink how Japan became modern and how Ainu women's lives and bodies are interpolated with this project of modernity. So today, um, rather than dwell on this, I, I will speak a lot about this history of heteropatriarchy and settler colonialism in Hokkaido, but I do want to focus on a celebration of Ainu women's resistance um, and their resilience in response to state-imposed heteropatriarchy. While narrating the systems of genocide and dispossession that were instituted in the name of statecraft, I would like to introduce you to what I am calling Ainu women's technologies of resistance. Okay, and so my understanding of this actually comes from um, this amazing woman, Suda Nobuko-san. Um, so unfortunately, we have very little access to Ainu women's voices or written records from this period of time before the 19th century. And too few of us are well-versed in Ainu oral literature, such as Menoko Yukara uh, and various forms of oral uh, narrative to understand women's legacies there. But Ainu women have left a rich tapestry of embroidered and written texts 
from the 18th century and beyond. Ainu women artists like Tsuda-san have pushed me to listen to the material record of the cloth itself. So through learning to read the material texts they have bequeathed to us, um, we can then learn their voices and their stories. So at the outset, um, and I'll show you another slide of her working very hard to uh, parse the texts of uh, ancestral Ainu women and their voices. At the outset, I want to argue that the dispossession of Ainu lands, the dismemberment of Ainu communities, and the intersectional forms of violence wherein bonds of family and community were destroyed are rooted in dual structures of heteropatriarchy and settler colonialism. And I argue um, that we cannot separate the two, and thus liberation for the Ainu community is also um, entangled with both of these structures, which persist in the present. Um, unlike North America and Australia, these forms were expressed in particular ways in Ainu Moshir. Settler colonialism as a framework helps to clarify how colonization of indigenous lands was a persistent and state orchestrated process that sought to erase the indigenous inhabitants of the land. Um, as Patrick Wolfe, who's written uh, a lot about settler colonialism, he argues that it was not a passing historical event. It was and is a persistent structure that continues to enact violence against indigenous peoples. Working in tandem with settler colonialism are the gendering aspects of imposing a hierarchical order on colonized peoples. So specifically, um, Arvin, Miley Arvin, Eve Tuck, and Angie Morrill describe this as heteropatriarchy, which they mean to, uh, by which they mean the imposition of social systems wherein patriarchy and heterosexuality are naturalized and all other social arrangements are seen as abnormal and aberrant. So in Japan, Ainu women describe how the Tokugawa and then the Meiji state forcibly imposed a vertical society uh, wherein males, seniority, and male power holders were given ultimate authority and women pushed to second or third class citizenship. Until the imposition of Japan's colonialism, Ainu women enjoyed what they describe as gender complementarity in which they cooperated in shared labor with Ainu men. And in fact, the Ainu society would have collapsed were it for this incredible um, dual, uh, dual and shared system of labor that they engaged in. So from, uh, from 1740 through 1855, and I apologize, this is not actually an image of the contract fisheries. Um, it's very hard to find those images. Um, I've only actually seen one in person in my travels, uh, in my time in Hokkaido. The, so from 1740s, uh, the Tokugawa claimed political and economic control of Hokkaido through what came to be known as the contract fishery system. Just a reminder, this is a full 120, almost 130 years before the actual um, official sort of territorial control um, and quote unquote annexation of Hokkaido as it's often described in Japanese history. Um, under these colonial incursions into Ainu Moshir, the Tokugawa government granted Matsumai, the Matsumai domain, control over the herring industry. Matsumai set up a gendered system of labor, and this is absolutely key to understanding uh, what uh, the situation for Ainu women. Um, under this gendered system of labor, they broke apart families, they separated Ainu women and men, um, and they rendered Ainu women vulnerable by exposing them to wajin men's predations. Um, specifically, many of these women were already um, in married arrangements. They were living with their families and their husbands, and they were split apart anyway. Um, Ainu women were forced to work in processing herring into fertilizer, cooking for the fisheries work, fishery workers, gathering kelp, and any other task um, that would be needed at the, the contract fisheries. Ainu men would be sent to distant fisheries on the opposite end of the island, and often they would be prohibited from visiting home for five or even 10 years. So it's a really extreme uh, system. From 1799, um, in order to make a long-term stay in Ezo, as Hokkaido was called at the time, um, in order to make this long-term stay appealing to, to Wajin men, Tokugawa introduced a new system known as the local wives, or in Japanese, genchi tsuma uh, policy. Under this policy, uh, local government representatives served as brokers by introducing Ainu women to Wajin fisheries personnel. And in the original Japanese text, the term used here is provision. Ainu women were provided to the fisheries uh, personnel, suggesting that Ainu women um, were essentially treated as commodities, um, just like housing, bedding, bathing facilities. So they were guaranteed 
access to Ainu women. That was the kind of language that's being used in these texts. In this sense, Ainu women were transformed into resources of the Tokugawa and deployed to lure Wajin fisheries managers um, and security uh, staff to Hokkaido. Although most historians today continue to use this Tokugawa euphemism of local wives as if this were a completely logical uh, term, um, I urge that we try and understand what the system meant for Ainu women in particular, but also for Ainu uh, men and entire families. And I think um, uh, reading from these texts, we can see a pattern um, of, of sort of uh, gendered violence um, in the nature of the way settler colonialism was imposed in Hokkaido. So for example, um, one historian, Takakura uh, Shinichiro, um, described the depravity of this system in these terms. With their impoverished sense of moral duty, Wajin men abandon everything to their sexual urges, raping as a woman and severing the relations between married Ainu couples. When one of the desired women had a husband, he was removed to a distant region and the woman would be targeted in his absence. So you can see how the system fomented this kind of um, uh, violence. Moreover, sexual colonialism and brutal exploitation of Ainu women only worsened from 1821 when the Tokugawa deployed 500 Wajin soldiers in border zones to defend against Russia. Um, and based on historical records, in one fishery, in Kushiro, nearly all of the soldiers uh, stationed there, which is around 50, had claimed Ainu women as local wives by 1850. So we can see this is a, a pattern across Hokkaido. And I'm sorry, I didn't define uh, wajin. Wajin refers to ethnic Japanese, and that's the ethnonym to distinguish uh, from Ainu. So you have um, indigenous Ainu and then ethnic wajin, referring to Japanese coming from mainland Japan. So essentially the settlers, the um, the immigrants to uh, Ainu Moshir, or to Ezo. Okay, so I'll speak more about the technologies of resistance below, but I did want to emphasize that Ainu women, out of necessity, um, devised a range of creative resistances and the refusal to submit to settler violence. Um, for example, women attempted to escape, they fought back, uh, and in one well-known case, one Ainu woman, um, this is sort of a famous case that got a lot of attention in the written records, who were the written records being chronicled by Japanese, um, by Wajin, one Ainu woman even managed to crush the penis of her would-be rapist. And this is a story that goes on because we hear about his fate many years later. He was still suffering from this injury, you know, five years later. So it was, she was very, uh, very intent on defending herself. It was her life. Uh, was in was hanging in the balance. Um, however, uh, there are far too many records of Wajin managers' um, violence against women. Women who resisted were tied with rope, they were flogged, they were leached to wooden beams, they were denied food and water, and they were tortured until they relented. When Ainu women contracted venereal diseases such as syphilis or other, um, other diseases through being sexually assaulted, they were abandoned. Uh, for those women who became pregnant, they were forced to abort the babies by drinking herbal tonics that had devastating um, and long-term impacts on the Ainu women's health. Um, so on the whole, the local wives policy constituted a destructive system of violence. Sorry, I forgot to show you this important slide. A destructive system of violence that indelibly imprinted many Ainu communities for generations. Together with the severe exploitation of the contract fisheries, which were, that's another kind of uh, a very uh, hard, uh, difficult, often described as slave labor, corvée labor. Um, these genocidal policies precipitated a population collapse in the early to mid 19th century, long before the political control of Ezo shifted from Ainu to the Meiji state um, with the institution of this, the nation, or excuse me, the, the, pro, the prefecture of Hokkaido. And this is another uh, image of some of the customs reform policies that were being instituted around the same time. Um, so I want to share with you one of the most graphic historical records of Ainu women's uh, resistance to Wajin men. Um, these records come to us from Matsuura Takeshiro. Um, and he was a Tokugawa-appointed surveyor in Ezo who's recognized as one of the most sympathetic Wajin observers of Ainu communities. He left a very important chronicle called uh, the Human Chronicles of Early Modern Ezo, or Kinsei Ezo Jinbutsuji. Um, and in fact, this book was so controversial, it was banned until his death. It was not published until 1912. Um, in this case, he describes three destitute women. He recounts his 1857 encounter with three Ainu women living in a makeshift hut uh, 
uh, on the Uryu River. The youngest woman, Yairishka, had been taken as the mistress of a Wajin watchman, um, and her husband was banished to the fishery in Otaru. So Uryu would be near Asahikawa region, so quite far from, from where her husband was stationed. Despite her resistance, Yairishka was repeatedly raped by the watchman. She contracted syphilis, and the watchman's passions toward her cooled immediately. He left her to starve alone without offering food or medicine um, to treat her. And instead, she solicited food from other Ainu at the fishery, but her condition soon worsened. Her flesh began to disintegrate. Desperate to escape this miserable situation, she hired a boat to take her upstream, and she actually attempted suicide, but fellow passengers on the boat uh, stopped her. Eventually, she disembarked and found an elder woman named Yaekwere living in a hut fashioned from butterbur stalks. Yaekwere had been abandoned when her children were taken away to work in the fisheries. Um, blind in one eye and in failing health, Yaekwere had resolved to subsist on wild plants until winter when she would give her ailing body to the earth. And then a second woman was living with her, Hisiri Ue. Uh, she had been left alone when her sons were dragged to the fisheries. And together, the three women lived together in the hut. Together they dreamed about the day they would surrender to starvation and with spirits liberated they would avenge their wajin tormentors in the fisheries. And this is how they related their experiences to Matsuda when he visited them. So as it's clear, it should be clear from uh, Yaekwere's story and Yaireshka's story, few of these relationships can be seen to have constituted consensual marriage. And I think the term local wives is absolutely um, not appropriate in this case. Um, for some Ainu women, being taken as a local wife was a death sentence, um, and many were told that they would never see their parents' faces again. So it was quite uh, terrifying. So now I want to talk about resistance. Um, the story of indigenous women, indigenous women, excuse me, <laughs> uh, indigenous women's bodies being the first wave of colonial horror and sexual subject subjugation is an old story and all too familiar to indigenous peoples across the globe. Yet Ainu women's experience stands as horrific sentinel of the barbarism of the settler colonial project in Japan. And thus, I think it's really important that we um, listen to their voices. So we do know, however, that Ainu women developed a range of techniques um, of resistance. And they summoned all of their creative uh, genius to, to resist um, these invasions. Cloth records communicate a complex narrative of the legacy of settler colonial violence. Um, for example, women's coping responses included inscribing uh, these defense systems on the cloth they wore on their own bodies or made for their own daughters. Um, as Suda's work has shown, uh, embroidered thorns were inscribed to defend women against the horrifying violence of sexual predation. Um, so they would innovate with specific technologies that allowed them to inoculate the body against these invaders. For the Aina community, um, Invaders come in the form not only of humans, but also of spiritual beings that carry the viruses, such as payoka kamui, or the smallpox kamui. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples, from about the early 19th century, you start to see patterns of women sewing fierce thorns into their embroidered patterns. Um, these are known as kirao. They would be sewn into the corners of embroidered patterns on the sleeves, the sleeves, the neck, the hem, the back piece, the back piece here, uh, sorry, pointer is this, right? Yeah, okay, let's see. let's see if I can use this. Yeah, so this back piece. And so it's a little hard to see, but these are the kirao here, these elongated uh, pieces of embroidery thread. Okay. So in the Ainu worldview, plants with thorns such as nettle, animals such as spiny crabs and blowfish, and other beings with thorny spear-like aspects were used to protect homes, canoes, and translated into embroidery patterns and also into tattoos. Um, the use of thorns to protect the body is an established tradition, or was an established tradition, but what changed during this period was the size, the number, and the variety of protective motifs employed by women. As Suda's son has argued, from the 19th century, Ainu artists began to embroider these exaggeratedly long kirao, like this. These are extremely long. Um, and other uh, motifs into their clothing patterns. So these are twice or even three times as long as earlier versions. Um, and so she argues that this is notable as a, um, as a response to the threat of the wajin predation. So yeah, you can see um, 
Oh, there we are. Yeah. So you can see all of these here on the edges. And um, generally, the sort of use of this kirao motif pattern would be focused on the outside edges of uh, kimono pattern. And here you can see it in perspective. This is the, the back piece, back piece here at the top. And then this would be the hem. It's very, this is an absolutely gorgeous um, example, I have to say. And here's another, just real quick, um, another example of really long kirao here at the bottom. Um, and another technique would be the twining of cords. And this has to do with um, the notion that um, the twining technique, so this is actually bass fiber that forms the spine here. And then it's twined with uh, cotton embroidery thread. Um, and the idea is that a twined cord like this um, makes one stronger. And people actually would often use these in the forest. I've heard stories about babies being left in the forest with a long cord of rope around them to protect the children from any um, malevolent spirit beings that might come upon the child. More example, more examples, excuse me. I just want to leave you with this um, uh, quotation from Chikap Mieko, who um, wrote very vividly about this, and I think it's quite striking. She said, no matter how viciously cornered, our women never stop fighting. Their resistance can be seen in the ikarkar, worked into their clothes. The ikarkar are the eyes of the kunerek kamwi, the owl, um, or the kotan koru kamwi, guarding the kotan, the Kamwe scow seek, scowls at the evil beings brought in by the colonists, guarding people from venereal diseases, smallpox, and tuberculosis, all gifts of the shamo. Shamo ref is uh, another word that refers to ethnic uh, Japanese or wajin. Ikarkar also embodies, therefore, the anger of our people. And just finally in closing, I want to mention that um, this is a contemporary example <clears throat> of resistance. This is at the United Nations uh, CEDAW hearings in 2009 when Ainu women actually spoke to the committee and um, testified to the Japanese government that in fact, um, we exist, we're not uh, majority Wajin, we're not majority Japanese, um, and it's really important to hear our stories and whenever you develop a policy to help with um, Ainu women, or excuse me, to help with women's rights and gender, uh, gender equality, you absolutely need to consider the voices of minority women such as um, Ainu women, Okinawan women, Zainichi Korean women, immigrant women, and Burakumin women. Um, and I'll end with an image of my wonderful uh, Toyama Bachan. Thank you so much for your time. Yaira Kirit. Okay.